board members are very uh, quickly bored if you only talk about ESG and climate in the lens of regulation. It's not necessarily a topic that they, they really enjoy hearing. What they really like to hear is, yes, there is a regulation and goal, obviously, but there is also an opportunity and you don't want to lose the opportunity to grow your business and to create value. Thank you for joining the Climate Money Work Podcast. I'm Kisa Shreen. Consultants can provide insight and information that drives products and drives markets forward. And with a focus on intelligence and data, there are clear opportunities for insights on issues such as the SEC's climate rule impending at the time of this recording, insights on security and privacy regulation, as well as the issues around pricing, supply chain, and even inclusion. Here to discuss some of these critical issues and some solutions and around how consultants are advising their clients are Sindra Maharaj is partner and an expert in finance, treasury risk and controls at Moringa with a focus on treasury management, balance sheet management, liquidity risk, resiliency, climate and ESG. Also we have with us Hortense Vihyat is an expert in climate and sustainability and strategy at Beringa. And her focus includes helping global banks enhance their climate risk programs in response to climate regulatory issues, as well as providing strategic advisory and building climate risk target states. Thank you, Sindra and Hortense for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. So first to set the stage, share who your clients are and who the prospects are, and also, what are their biggest concerns? What are you hearing from your clients? So Kisa, when you say who are our clients, let me tell you a little bit about Beringa to start off with. So Beringa Partners is a global management consulting firm. We're headquartered out of the UK with a reach across the US as well as within Asia. And when you ask me who are our clients, that's a pretty big topic for me to kind of get into. It's a little bit around financial services. So that's a big chunk of our clients. Hortense and I both sit within our financial services practice. But Beringa as a whole works really closely with energy and resources clients. So if you think of some of the big names there, and we're definitely working with them as well as within the products and services space. So here within the US, those are three of our key industries that we work in. And as I mentioned to you, financial services is sort of hot on to myself, our bread and butter. Well, who within the financial services do we work with? It's, it's across the spectrum. So it's with the large global systemically important banks. It's with uh, what we call the regional banks. And I'm sure we can get into a little bit about what's going on within that sector right now, as well as within the investment management and private equity space. So we really kind of cover that whole gamut. And I know Hortons can talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing in the insurance space as well. Great, excellent. So I'm hearing from a banking perspective, I'm hearing likely climate scenario analysis issues are being discussed. From an insurance perspective, physical climate risk, I'm sure those are issues being discussed. Hortense, tell us about some of the major issues that you're seeing with insurers right now as it relates to various types of insurance, whether we're talking about um, those who have mortgages as well as more business and commercial related insurance. Yeah, issues. so on, on the insurance side, we're seeing some of the major issues being across the spectrum of the climate and sustainability journey. So if I start about the climate risk side, for example, it's climate risk integration into the entire operating model processes. And, and when we talk about climate risk and integration, it's really thinking about how does actually climate impact my insuring portfo insured portfolio and leveraging tools and capabilities such as scenario analysis to really understand the impact. So that's one part of the issue that insurers are, are having. And when we talk about scenario analysis capabilities and tools, it's usually used for both physical risk and transition risk, right? So we all often hear about insurance issues around climate from a physical risk standpoint, but there is also all the transition risk aspect that needs to be assessed by insurers. Obviously, disclosures, 
is one of their important challenge at the moment. I mentioned SEC at the beginning of the of this podcast. Uh, obviously, forefront of everyone's mind, uh, the final rule is going to be about what it means to comply with the SEC rule, uh, what it means to comply with all the other frameworks and reporting standards out there. So the climate risk integration and the disclosure aspect is probably the two main elements that insurers are in mind at the moment. So let's speak specifically about how you are advising your clients as it relates to the SEC rule. Are there certain areas that you say now, even before the rule comes down, that we are certain that these are going to be some key areas that we need to look at, specifically as it relates to scope three emissions? I know that's been largely something that's been discussed, but what source, if you could have a three or five point plan of those things you've been talking about with insurers, with banks, and even with institutional investors, what do those three to five points look like, the most important points of the SEC's rule? Yeah, maybe I'll take it, and then Hotans, feel free to jump in here. A couple of things, like Kisa, I'd say Hotans mentioned scenario analysis activities. So the idea of being able to assess the resilience of climate-related risks and the required disclosures. But when we talk about scenario analysis, it's also the idea of including the parameters, the assumptions, the analytical analysis that's coming along with the impacts from the scenario. So when you think about it, it's not just being able to create the results, but sort of the, the narrative and that goes with it is really important. So that's one. You mentioned scope three kind of coming into play. Well, that's really important. And then being able to start to think about if you have set a decarbonization plan, the disclosure of your scope three targets, as well as disclosures of your transition plans. I think there's also something around the board and the climate risk expertise within your board and the governance around that. And then last but not least, it's the piece around materiality, which has been a big sticking point when we think about the SEC rules, is that any climate costs that are really at that 1% materiality threshold needs to be reported. And why is that a sticking point is that it differs to the 5% materiality threshold that firms typically adhere to within their financial statements. So if we were to drive deeper into these three points, so point being scenario analysis, as well as the impacts from the scenarios and building the narrative that goes along with it, I'm assuming we're talking about what's being reported and not necessarily only the quantitative elements, but building the narrative, meaning the qualitative points of what's happening, as well as what we're doing, what the bank is doing um, in these scenarios. The second piece, the decarbonization plan disclosing scope three, um, very important to do. Um, if I, that, and then again, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. I'm assuming this means advising clients, hey, if there is something missing, alert your teams and let the report disclose that there is something missing. Let the report disclose the governance and board issues. And then number three, the materiality. My assumptions correct about those things that you're advising your clients or specifically what are you advising your clients on these three points about? What are you telling them they should do as a best practice? Yeah, so just in terms of the materiality, I would say the number three is really around the board expertise. It's really a big one and sort of the idea of how do you start to build that expertise within your organization starting at the board level? So one of the key areas that we definitely focus in on and have been talking to a lot of our clients on is around the idea of training. How do you start to get climate training and how does that start to distill throughout your organization and starting at the board level, but also being embedded within your risk organization. It's really closely linked though to the point on the decarbonization strategy that we talked about. And there's a lot of work that we've done and that we're advising our clients on and Hotons can, can bring this to life for us a little bit in terms of working with like front office, working with the bankers, thinking about the different sectors. Um, so maybe Hotons, if you want yes, to kind of jump in there. And, and we're going to touch on different points that you mentioned actually Kisa by going through training because Training is a quite broad ask, uh, but when we think of, of training uh, at Beringa, especially when we think about training the front office and the bankers, so the client facing team, we always think about training from a value creation and monetization opportunity side, which is extremely important. And, and it's actually an interesting difference and dynamic that we are seeing if we compared with Europe and the US. The Europe, the Europe and, and the UK have driven the climate agenda through the regulations, whereas in the US, the 
climate agenda has been mostly driven by the opportunity side, which I think is, is, is super interesting when you think about it. At the end of the day, financial institutions, banking institutions have to drive PNL and value creation. So the way we are approaching training for our clients is really much helping them understand what their client's transition journey is about. And it goes through understanding the, we call that credible transition plan assessment. So going through a framework, which is really engaging with the clients through a framework and, and understanding what they're planning to do. And do they have enough capex to actually support that transition? Is it credible as a plan? And then based on that, helping clients to think about the opportunities how do they need to engage with their client? What type of projects do they need to uh, propose to their clients? What type of products? How can they leverage Inflation Reduction Act uh, to generate uh, new opportunities? It's not the same way to engage uh, guards in terms of transition versus a pioneer. And that's how we try to upskill uh, front office and anchors. Um, and we train board uh, teams because a lot of our work around the SEC is also to... Uh, um, in board members, uh, because it's one of the kind of ask around the SEC, um, this is the same exact topic. The board members are very uh, quickly bored if you only talk about ESG and climate in the lens of regulation. It's not necessarily a topic that they, they really enjoy hearing. What they really like to hear is, yes, there is a regulation and goal, obviously, but there is also an opportunity. And you don't want to lose the opportunity to grow your business and to create value. So oh, th this is great in terms of the training piece. I would really like to get into the scope three piece because, yep. you know, you hear corporate saying this is nearly impossible. How can we do this? So in talking to corporations who and leaders who think it's really not easy to measure this, is this going to be asked of us? Where do we start? What is the advice for them? Sindra, I, I might take this one to begin with and then feel free to jump in. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if it's uh, worth maybe um, explaining what SCOP3 is. Uh, we get to it into details because I know that one of the in ESG and climate spaces, I will love using a bunch of acronyms. Um, so, so maybe um, just anchoring into what SCOP3 is. Um, so the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which is a widely accepted standard for accounting and reporting around greenhouse gas emissions, categorize emissions into three scopes. So scope one, which is direct emissions from company-owned assets. Scope two, which are indirect emissions from the company purchased energy. Those scope one and scope two are relatively easy, I would say, to gather. Uh, but the challenge is around scope three, which is basically all indirect emissions in the company's value chain. And that contains, the scope three by itself, contains 15 different categories. So that doesn't help. Um, and some examples of these categories are business travels and finance emissions. And I'm going to pause on finance emissions and dive on the finance emissions because this is where there is a lot of issue on the financial services side. If you think about finance emissions on the financial institution side, that's where the majority of their emissions are across scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. Essentially, for an example of a bank, we're asking the bank to account the number of emissions that they're um, actually supporting through their loans, through their funding. So it's, it's, it's huge, depending on the size of the company, but it, it can be quite huge. Um, and so what we're seeing in terms of challenges, and, and you highlighted like the overall data challenge, um, but it's a little bit um, specific across the data challenge. We're seeing different challenges such as data collection and the verification of the data. So think about data quality. Um, so because it, uh, the scope three emissions originate from a very wide range of activities across the value chain, that can involve numerous suppliers, numerous customers, and numerous partners to gather the data we, from. Um, an example is uh, we actually supported one of our clients in recently in their scope three emissions calculation, and it was just business travel, not even finance emission. Um, it took literally probably three months to go and get to each of their supplier and ask them the data, come with a, a, a strong, robust framework, Excel spreadsheet. And, and it's not only because it's, it's, it's not necessarily on our consulting side, because we had the framework in place. It was more on the client side 
gathering all their supplier name, gathering exactly who they had to reach out on the supplier side. If you're trying to get some data around a specific lease, for example, who are you going to ask? Uh, so it, it, it takes a lot of time to really identify who are the people you need to talk to. And, and then from a client and finance emission side, it takes time to also engage with your clients specifically. And that goes back to the training piece, which is the way we are helping clients getting through their data collection, and especially for the missing data that they cannot have through vendors, is to define how they get to their clients in a meaningful way. So not just to ask them, oh, can you please provide more data so I can actually ca calculate my scope three finance emissions is, I'd like to understand better the data around scope three because I can inform you better on new type of technology, new type of products that we can actually help you through. So that, that forms an entire client engagement strategy, which helps us so through data collection. Um, there is one other piece, which is around the standardization of data. So yes, it's difficult to get the data. It's difficult to verify the data quality. It's difficult to engage your client uh, to gather more data, but it's also difficult to come with a very consistent way of looking at those data. The reporting methods and the metrics for emissions data vary depending on the data sources, uh, depending on the providers, et cetera. So it can be very challenging. So the way we're helping our clients too is to make sure that they come with the right set of methodologies and they are very clear in terms of how they want to calculate their scope three emission, what is the methodology they want to use, and then they can actually set their own standard in terms of the, the way they, they gather their ring data. If I can just add on to that for two seconds there. I think you said that's bringing up actually an additional layer of like when you ask us, what are we advising clients on and conversation that's coming up and work that we're doing. So just given the current environment that we're in right now, especially within the financial services space, cost optimization or cost of business is getting higher. So we know interest rates are rising, cost of funding is increasing for a lot of some of those middle tier banks, even investment managers. Um, so what this is breeding is actually an opportunity for firms. We talk about P&L generation, they are profit generation, but it's also breeding an opportunity for firms to start to go down like data optimization. So we're seeing a lot of strategies starting to move where some of, for some of our firms being driven by this agenda going down the path of how do I start to rationalize my data? Should I start to undertake more of these cost optimization programs, right? Standardization programs um, that's coming into play. And I'm talking about data. I want to move over into data more broadly. So we're talking about physical risk data, but if we look at the broad data landscape, you have the physical climate risk data, but you also have ESG rankings and the, the sub data, if you will, the data that goes into the rankings, great case. We also have data around um, boards and directors, companies or not-for-profits specifically that see various issues um, with the work that some corporates are doing. Um, we have media data that gives a ranking in terms of whether different media um, are speaking positively or negatively about a company or issues. So sanctions, whether it's company sanctions, and also that could be a part of the G governance in ESG as well as the social. So we see a broad range of, of data is what we're trying to say here. Have you seen a way that your clients have used data in a very unique way to find solutions, looking at the various types of data that we have to offer now? I'm happy to start, Sindra, and, and feel free to jump in. Um, I think one very, I don't know if it's innovative, but the great way we've seen the client doing, which was very different than the other ones, was to create, um, they created this centralized ESG and climate data hub, which was essentially a new centralized platform for all their climate and ESG data, which is very different from what we are seeing other clients doing, because most of our clients, even if it's smaller entity, smaller companies or larger companies, they tend to go after the data depending on the need at the moment. So, well, disclosures requirements. Well, I, I need those data points for this disclosure. Uh, it's the SEC disclosures. Well, actually, CSRD disclosures, which is the new European disclosures, I need the, another set of data for these disclosures. And not necessarily thinking about the data in a strategic way, but really more about um, 
I ever have a need, I need to ask the data team to bring me new data sets. And at the end of the day, we're seeing clients struggling after six months, a year in their ESG and climate data journey, because they realize that they haven't rationalized at all their data sets and they have duplicate information. They have data that says the same, that are the title are the same, but are not necessarily calculated the same way. Um, so, so again, having this, this idea of a centralized ESG and, and climate data hub being driven, especially by use cases. And I'm, I'm insisting on the word use cases because that's something that, um, not a lot of clients are essentially doing properly. Uh, so drive, drive the client use case and define what data needs to be brought in based on this use case. And it's been very efficient because this climate and ESG data hub usually have one ownership, one client, climate and ESG data owner who is driving the entire data strategy for the, for the company. So that, that, that is, this client is one of the only clients that I've seen doing it yet. The other ones are marching toward that, but everybody was such in a rush to get data. It was all about ESG data, climate data, not necessarily thinking about how they would use it. Interesting. So we have the the clients, we have the investors or the bankers, the insurers, but the vendors who are supplying the data, what can they do to make this data a bit, number one, to ensure that there's reduced noise and there is data that actually produces insights? And number two, to make sure the data is can be received, whether it's technically or whether it's um, just the knowledge on the data can be received by the leaders in these different areas to make sure they can be more effective. What can vendors do in this situation? Um, so, so I have a couple of thoughts, and I'm sure Sindra has, has some as well. But uh, starting maybe with the ESG rating agencies, um, a lot of noise has been around the inconsistency across the way the ESG rating were actually calculated. So um, good news or bad news, I'm, I'm not going to take any, any assumption here, but I know that the EU is actually working on specific requirements around ESG rating providers to actually drive consistency um, around the way they are making their rating. What are the exact criteria that they are using to come with an ESG rating? So that, that, that will help uh, definitely to set the scene in terms of what, how consistency can be brought. Um, I know one of the challenges, and, and we've been helping clients through that, is that sometimes those ESG rating providers, uh, vendors, have, have a lot to do, right? They have a lot to consume in terms of disclosures to come with an ESG rating. And if they don't necessarily have the information, um, they won't engage necessarily with the client to get the additional information that they have. So our client was actually struggling with their ESG rating, although they had made a lot of progress, they had made a lot of um, effort in their climate and ESG journey, those information weren't brought to life to those um, ESG rating providers. And so their scores kept dropping and dropping and dropping. So they didn't understand. So we help them coming with a very strong and robust story documentation and engage with actually their ESG rating, rating providers to tell them about all the good work that they had done. But in the perfect, in a perfect world, you wouldn't necessarily ask a client to go talk to the ESG rating uh, provider and agency to tell their story. You would like uh, the mechanism to work a little bit uh, better. Um, but again, I think the consistency in the frameworks that maybe we're going to come with maturity will help uh, in that in that regard. Sindra, do you want to add something maybe here? Yeah, I think that's a really good point that you just brought up there, Hortense. And it's around agility that I think is really important here. So that client that you're talking about there, where we help them, and they kept, they were doing all of this great work, right, in terms of ESG, but there, there was sort of a time lag that was happening between their great work being recognized and the ESG rating sort of picking it up. And I feel like there's something there around, and I don't think he said something that we have to solve for today, especially in the ESG space, but something to think about, especially within the broader banking like and financial services space is around the agility and the speed of information. And that's something that we saw kind of coming in. You mentioned not just like from a climate risk perspective, but some of the social and the governance. So some of what I, we saw recently with Silicon Valley Bank and some of those mid-tier banks, right? There was speed of information 
social media driving a lot of that. And I think we're going to see more and more down that space mm -hmm. um, as time comes. And it, it also factors in, sorry, one more point. One is speed of information, but two is sort of the re what do you do with this data? So one thing is data collection, but I think there's another piece of the analysis, the reporting, the metrics that we start to look at. And I think within the climate space that, and the ESG space, something that's still continuing to evolve and probably will continue to evolve for a little bit. Mm, okay. So what I'm hearing there is being mindful of big data. If we define big data as high volume, high velocity, um, as well as high veracity, hopefully um, big data is something that should be kept in mind. You mentioned earlier about being future focused. And for those leaders who want to be strategic about the data they purchase, they want to be strategic about how they analyze it, but they're maybe having issues about what are the right questions to ask to make sure that I am future focused? How should I look at things to make sure I am strategic? It comes with a shift in mindset, quite frankly, for some folks. What sorts of questions do they need to ask? How can they be strategic? How can they be future focused? Um, what needs to be top of mind for them? How do they need to change their thinking to make sure that the data and the analysis is in fact strategic and it is in fact some that can solve for future issues? So uh, I think we can approach that question in multiple ways, Tisa, to be honest, right? When you start, when you ask that in terms of how do you change mindset to become future thinking? That's a really hard question. I think, um, I come from a background very much within the risk and regulatory space. I think about stuff very much from financial resource management. So for me, I kind of start at that bottom level and sort of say, okay, well, what is that risk reward that we're starting to think about and build it up from there? But that's why it's so important to be able to do that is to making sure you can't do that on your own. There's something around teams and there's something around having the right people around you. So as I said, I start at the bottom, starting off with, you know, a strong risk mitigation thinking, but I can guarantee you, I advise my clients to sort of make sure they have in the room somebody else who's a little bit more future thinking and who's looking at some of those market trends, who's thinking about stuff a little bit differently, who's looking at those big data trends. So one of my big things is when, when we're thinking about how do we make this mind shift is, is a little bit as leaders surrounding ourselves with sort of that, that diversity of thought um, is really, really important uh, to bring to the table. Because I think where we're going as an, as an industry, where we're going as a uh, broader from a macroeconomic, it's really hard to try and solve some of this in silos right now. And uh, an important way to do that is to bring others in. And maybe if I can add a little bit here, I, I'll go back to one thing that I mentioned earlier, which is around the use cases. And, and I keep mentioning and insisting on that because Again, if, if you want to be strategic about around your data, you need to be strategic about the needs. And, and one of the questions that the regulators have around um, integration of climate into the operating model is ultimately they'd like to see the climate consideration being included into the strategic planning of a company. And how do you get to integration of, into strategic planning is only if you get accurate, reliable data that you can action on. And, and linking back to the use cases, going to the business, going to the, to the risk management team, going to the finance team and asking them in the next five years, what are the key use cases that you're gonna have to solve for in the ESG and climate space? And, and a use case is a little bit higher levels and very detailed requirements. It's okay, I'm, I'm on the risk management side. I know that I'm gonna have to monitor um, my climate risk properly. I need to identify my risk around climate and ESG. I need to assess my uh, risk around climate and ESG. And I'm going to have to report on it and define some key risk indicators and thresholds. That, that's the definition of a use cases. On the front of this side, I need to be able to generate new opportunities and make sure that I'm leveraged Inflation Reduction Act incentives and I engage properly with my client. That's use cases. So the strategic way of approaching data is really taking the lens of use cases um, in, my, in my mind. Okay, let's talk about revenue generation. Um, let's talk about some of the interesting conversations that you're having with clients about 
new ways to generate revenue um, that have to do perhaps with um, new ways that we're looking at energy, new ways that we're looking at pricing, or even dealing with supply chain issues and how it can be turned on its head, so geopolitical issues. So let's look at revenue generation in terms of some of these new economic geopolitical realities that we have here. And what have you seen in terms of dynamic, um, sustainable revenue generation opportunities that have really come from this new economic and geopolitical reality that we're in now? One thing that Sindra mentioned, Kisa, which is important to, to bear in mind, especially I was thinking about the opportunity side and, and bearing in mind that both Sindra and I are advising financial services institutions, is that um, we have a very strong energy and resources team uh, here, um, both in the U.S. and, and globally. And, and part of the way we are advising our clients and is to bring our two worlds together to them, to, to bring them the best of um, our skill set. So we talk, obviously, about um, the regulatory and disclosure exercise. And, and I mentioned before, um, uh, the way we think about um, the ESG and climate agenda is very much about the opportunity side, because at the end of the day, it's all about risk and opportunities. And obviously, we've seen the U.S. making a huge push in the clean energy investment uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which was signed into law, I think, a year ago by now. Um, essentially, what it is about, it's 400 billion clean energy stimulus, which will mobilize 1.2 trillion in direct investment over the next decade and bringing energy, finance, and sustainability opportunities together. So when we think about it, the Inflation Reduction Act um, incentives are going to is going to drive further renewable development and increase activity in more nascent sector, including hydrogen, um, carbon capture storage, and clean tech manufacturing. So. All of those new technologies, those new activities, that's where we're bringing our energy and resource team to take a look at the U.S. new technology map and the roadmap ahead and really help our bankers, uh, the bankers and um, our clients to identify where they want to put their bets and to really understand what it means. Because um, our global climate risk lead very often says uh, green doesn't mean not risky. Uh, so it doesn't mean like it's it's not because it's a hydrogen company that it doesn't it's not risky. So always keeping that lens as well, which is yes, it's clean, yes, it, well, it's green, but is it risky? Is it the good the good approach uh, for the financial institution? Um, so yeah, our team is really focusing on on those topics, and and our team is actually helping sometimes bankers to go in front of their credit committee to explain with them. Why is this deal or why is this transaction or why is this opportunity is the good for the for the company? So we're really working in partnership with, with the fraud office team. And this is great. I think you know if we look at some of the key issues that we're talking about a lot today, we really need to talk a bit about AI, regenerative AI, and how that is playing a role in moving clients forward, um, how it's playing a role in helping to generate revenue, helping to generate insights. Have you really started having deeper discussions around regenerative AI? What are your clients saying? Are they frightened? Are they excited? What's the reaction? I think I'll take that hot on and jump in. So definitely a topic of interest and uh, that we're seeing within our client space. I, you know, funny enough, Hortense mentioned use cases a lot in in her in talking here, and I think you were mentioning Hortense a lot of use cases that relates to climate. But what I'm starting to see within our space is a lot of excitement around Gen AI, a lot of thinking around the different use cases that are applicable. So sort of starting to map across an institution, front to back, what are those what are those applicability thinkings around that. Um, or use cases around that. I don't think it's as far, far in terms of the embedding as we have been thinking about with climate, but there is a lot of discussion happening right now around the overall, how do I start to think about digital risk within my overall risk management framework? So funny enough, you mentioned that piece. I think of Gen AI, I think of digital risk as sort of another emerging risk that's coming into place. So just as the path we've been down or we're going down within the climate risk space, and we've been talking a lot about the embedding of that, we're starting to look at the same thing within the Gen AI space. And how is that manifesting right now? Well, it's manifesting within, how do I start to think about this within my compliance frameworks? 
So how do I start to think about it within my operational risk frameworks? What type of controls do I need to put into place? Is there upskilling of my teams that I need to do this with? And depending on who you're talking to within an organization, it's going to be a little bit of a different conversation. So operational risk, as well as potentially creating efficiencies in the operation. 100%. Okay. okay. 100%. We're, we're definitely seeing that coming in, in terms of like process simplification, right? Compliance functions starting to th use like in the old days, old days, it's not that old, I'm going to like, but you know, we have the idea of like chatbots. Well, those chatbots are now starting to evolve, right? With, with Gen AI. So, a lot to come from that, I think, in that space. So Baringo recently received the honor, um, and it was from Forbes, of a world's best management consulting firm, um, 2023. What differentiates, in your mind, consulting firms, consultants, when it comes to supporting these climate goals, supporting an understanding of risks, and really helping the clients to get to where they are? What's the key differentiator between consultancies, whether they're mid-size or smaller, to really support yeah. the client? Yeah, great question. I'm sure Hortense and I can both take that question in different ways and give a little bit of our experience. So that's something that we're really proud of in terms of that, um, that recognition. But a couple of things from our perspective. So one, for Beringo, we're actually a B Corp certified consulting firm and one of the few right that can say that so that's something that shows you mentioned sustainability people sustainability are built into our processes and how we think about our business we really look at our business as for the long-term value right we're thinking about it from that perspective so that's one but i think what this what this thing also distinguishes us is not just our people agenda but it's the fact and hopefully you're hearing it a little bit on this call we love to say it. It's it's our subject matter expertise, a little bit of our geekiness in the in the different areas that that we love to uh, be in. And I think if you talk to other people in Baringa, we actually go around saying that we are geeky. Which is um, so I think that's another uh, one. You're really getting people working with us who are rolling up their sleeves and and deep into the subject matter content. Um, and and I think that's 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 testament to me and Hortense being here today. Right? We sort of bring our blends of uh skill sets together so that's that's another one and then last but not least is and i know this is going to sound a little uh a little different it's just in terms of how we work so we tend to go out we're working with our clients advising sitting right next to them at all levels of the organization so majority of our team uh, uh have experience working either in the industry um and who can come in and who have sat in the seat of the client before. So that's where from Beringa's standpoint, and you kind of mentioned a little bit about mid-size and sort of thinking about it that way, I think we're, we're different to, to others and differentiate ourselves. So to both um, Hortense and Sindra, our final question, tell us one thing we didn't know about strategic planning. What can make it successful? What is the top key ingredient or if there's a top three Tell us something that we did not know about strategic planning and success. From, for, from my perspective, it's a lot of, or there's something that we've been talking a lot about internally in, in Beringa, and it's really around this idea of the connective tissue. When you talk about strategic planning, it can't be done in a bubble. You need to do it with different skill sets coming to the table, different strengths coming to the table. I mentioned diversity of thought coming to the table. I think that is really, really important um, to think about and to have. In the data-driven approach, we talked about a lot, Keith, about data. Strategic planning and integration cannot be done without the right data and the right level of data quality. So thinking carefully and strategically about which data to get in, involved and how it actually um, informs strategic planning and decision making. Excellent. So from data to really being able to focus in on specific areas, um, strategy really means being all in, all present and diving in. I appreciate you answering that question on strategy. For those who are Michael Porter fans, um, they would say, well, strategy and planning or stack tactics, those are different things. But you answered the strategy piece right on. I do appreciate that. Sindra Hortense, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Kista. Thanks so much. 
Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Climate Money Work. Please follow the show wherever you're listening right now. If you have any questions, feedback, or pitches, please get in touch with the team at cmw at shrugcontent.com. Again, that's cmw at shrug, S-H-R-U-G, content.com. Now you can learn more about the show at kisashreen.com forward slash podcast. You can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Kisa Shreen and thank you for listening. Be well.